Welcome to the IJDM 12 Days of Christmas special featuring DOS programs and of course not games. Coming up next. Another visitor. Stay a while. Stay forever. Getting right into it, uh, December is basically a thing where YouTubers do something DOS related for December. And instead of doing just one thing, and since I didn't do it last year, I'm going to do 12 things. And it's all going to be within this uh, DOS environment. We're going to kind of use DOSBox just because it's easier to film, it's easier to use, and it pretty much replicates DOS exactly. So, I mean, why bother using a, another laptop for most of this stuff? I will have to for a few certain programs just because of the nature of them, for some reason, they just won't work properly in DOSBox. I'm not really sure why. It's just one of those things. So why DOS? Well, here's the thing. Uh, nowadays, you have Windows 10, you have Windows 11, you have Mac OS, you have iOS, you have Android. Those are all good operating systems. They're easy to use. Anybody can figure them out pretty much. I mean, if you're a little older in technology, yeah, I get it. You know, it's, that's the thing with, with things advancing. But on this situation with DOS, you actually had to learn the operating system. And in many ways, it actually helped a lot of people learn about computers because you're actually inter interacting with the actual operating system rather than through a GUI or GUI, which is a general user interface, which is basically like a fake environment it creates um, to visualize what you're seeing, what's operating in behind. And with DOS, it pretty much was a pure thing because what you were seeing was what you're getting for the most part. I mean, you were operating in a text environment. If you wanted to see your directory, you type, you know, directory. And there it was. It, it was just a cool thing that, that I thought back in the day, I mean, I started with this and it was, it was a, definitely a, a learning curve, uh, you know, being that young, but I did figure things out and I was able to write my own little files and stuff and, and through friends and exchanging software, get a few programs back in the day. And as things progress, I've ran a few businesses through my life. I've worked on a lot of computers. So I actually kind of kept a small catalog of old DOS programs. And so my question was, are any of these programs actually useful today? Can you actually use any of these programs in a modern day environment? You'll be surprised at the answer. So let's just get into it. Now with DOS, a few simple commands you, you obviously need to know, and I mean, you just saw me type it in, is directory. Directory gives you your directory, but if you have too many files in one of your directories, obviously you can't see them all. So you can do this little command uh, directory slash W, or you can do directory slash P, which actually lets you page through and see each directory. With DOS, you did actually have an option in some of the later versions, and I think it was available in earlier versions, of something called DOS Shell, which is actually a visualized program. It was like, it almost looked like an earlier form of Windows. It was useful for doing quick things and you could move things around, but overall, it was just as easy just to stay right in the, the, uh, the actual DOS environment. You can, we can go into the first uh, thing, and this is pretty much the first day of Christmas we're on now. We're not gonna sing the song or do anything weird like that. We're just gonna kind of go one through 12. And on the first day, well, we have, you know, you have your directories like I showed you. Of course, one of the, the cool things you could do if you didn't want to do all the directories and all the typing commands, you could make your own little menu systems. And there was a bunch of them out there. I used one just called push button menu. I think I got it from somebody that worked at a library back in the day. And this is a cool little program because you could customize it and set up your menus and set up which programs you ran. So just as an example, and this one I just set up real quick, like you could go right into your DOS shell, or if you wanted to go to the edit program, or have your games in one menu, or you had an invoicing program, you could use that, or some type of accounting program. ProWrite, obviously, for writing more, you know, certain types of letters, which is a program we're going to get into later, and utilities menu for defragging and so forth. So just a simple little thing, and then of course you could have a password. Um, protect that to get in and out of the menu or going to certain ones, which was kind of nice, but of course it's only protection within the actual menu system. On that note, let's move on to number two. Okay, well, yep, here you go. Two turtle doves. Well, technically they're ringneck doves, but uh, close enough. <laughs> let's just move on. 
Our next thing is going to be a cool little thing uh, going back to our DOS prompt here. Uh, we are going to go into a uh, thing about multimedia. So this will be kind of fun. I should probably save this for later in the video, but let's just go into it now and kind of get things rolling a little bit with this cool program called MPX Play. Um, of course, I got to get into the directory so then I can do... <laughs> Sometimes you forget. I don't use this a lot. I, I went through a few things, setting a few things up, but uh, memory. So what you have here is a full-on um, program that runs and plays music, which is super cool, and I'm hoping to get into my Z drive. But uh, yeah, you could play some music and easily just uh, put your MP3s in there, create playlists. I mean, it was a little clunky, but... Back in the day when I used to DJ and MP3 started coming around, I actually used this program a lot because I could set up a playlist. It would do cross fades, cross uh, fades in and out. Um, it would auto volume the, uh, the levels so that you know, certain songs wouldn't come in too hot or too low. And it was really a, a cool little thing. And I mean, the, at the program playing and we can only play a section of it. Of course, I've started the one song that, well, you know. Okay, we'll pause that for now. But the, the, the cool thing you just saw was obviously with those meters and the, the views on the, on the right side underneath all the different controls. And you could, of course, use your mouse to do certain things like hit play and stop. And, and it was a very functional program. And if I had a playlist, it would obviously go over in this section here where I'm moving the cursor. Um, the playlist would load over there. Let's just actually see if it'll load a playlist. Yeah, see, there's the playlist there. And you can tab over and use that. And I think there was a way, if you had it preload the pray, the the playlist, the playlist, um, then you, it wouldn't even actually show this bit over here. It would just show this on the main screen. So if you're, you could actually use it for like some type of like maybe um, amateur uh, radio, pirate radio thing or a college radio station for like some type of automation back in the day too, because those automation systems were not cheap. All right, so that's MPX Play, does a lot of stuff. Um, you may have seen it on a few different YouTube videos, but I obviously can't play a lot of music because of reasons. So we're just going to exit right out of that, go back to our main directory, and we're going to go into another audio program. And again, I can use these like in a DOS box thing, but it's just as easy to use one of my music programs that's pre-installed on Windows. But if I'm feeling nostalgic, I can load up a few MP3s in, in DOSBox and use MPX Play or this program that I'm about to show that you can play music and just get this you know, different little effect that, that you're not normally used to. So this is DSS. This is another uh, music thing. You can set up playlists and, and certain things, but uh, we'll just use the same set of songs here. And... Uh Yeah, so there you go. And as you can see in the program, because I have no way of pausing it or anything, but uh, it had a cool VU thing that actually it, it keeps in sync pretty well for a DOS environment. I mean, picture this running on a DOS computer. I would say for most MP3s, you need to be at least between 100 and um, safely 133 megahertz for MP3s to play correctly. And I mean, I got one of my uh, ThinkPads, I think that's a, it's a 120 megahertz and it runs MP3 just fine. Okay, now that we exited out of that, um, we're gonna jump to another computer for this next little bit for a program called QuickView Pro. And the reason I'm doing this is because if, I'm, if memory serves, I actually have a couple of videos that I did uh, using those Mavica cameras uh, a, video, a bunch of videos back and I did try playing it on that so it'd be a cool thing to see on a vintage computer so we'll go ahead and do that now. Here we go in QV Pro so let's get to the directory that actually has something stored on it and I believe that is in the temp folder so it's just this handy dandy file browser and there's some video so let's see if it plays. Yeah, you may recognize that from one of my uh, end tags. Video running in DOS. And we're on to day number four. And we're going to go into basically word processing programs. And while I could cover every single one of them, I mean, there's copies out there. There was WordStar, there was WordPerfect. And one that I really learned 
in my day and I had access to was ProWrite. So that's the one we'll use today. So let's see, is it ProWrite? Yes, ProWrite. So yeah, there's your directory and then there's all the files and obviously I wrote a few scripts in there and I believe it's just PW to start it. So yeah, there it is. And I got this obviously in a red mode. So if I go into create, um, there it is. Yeah. And if you need to underline something, yeah, that's where this whole thing got really weird. Like you hit control U to underline. And then I think the bold, it turns you, see, it doesn't actually have the capability of doing it. So it does it in color codes. If something is, is either bold or underlined, um, or both. I guess green is both. Let's try, let's try this. Yeah, so if it's bold, it actually does kind of bold it out. And if it's underlined, then it, it does something else. Underline is yellow, both is green. Okay, so that's how it goes. This thing had some other nifty little things. You had your file, um, you can get your files, save your files, print your files, like any older program you'd have today, really. It's just less complicated. Um, and in some ways, in some ways not. And then of course you could, uh, do different things with edit commands here. If you needed the shortcut, uh, formatting your margins and so forth and spell and grammar check, which was pretty cool today. And then of course there was an address book you could uh, do with this program as well. I just, I, it's just one of my go-to ones because it was just to me what I learned on and what was easy. And if you want to change your, change your, uh, screen colors, I think it was default. That was like the one you get you know, normally, and then there's this darker blue one, then there's like this red one. If somebody does want to see um, some examples of WordPerfect or whatever, I can always do a follow-up video on some of these applications. And I was doing this video because I was thinking about, you see a lot of videos and I was kind of doing research ahead of time. I saw a lot of videos on YouTube about DOS gaming and doing different things in DOS, but I've never seen anything that kind of like goes over some of the business software, some of the other stuff that was around in the day. So I figured I'd kind of combine one and do one combo package, hence the 12 days of Christmas gimmick. So let's move on. As I just said, with business software, this is kind of one of those things that I was trying different businesses at the time and testing different products. One of the early ones I covered back in the day was just a simple system called DHPOS. Um, still partially supported. What is the password? That's the password. What is the pin? That's the pin. So yeah, just a cool little, no apron isn't running, I lied. But uh, yeah, this is pretty much a simple thing. This is totally usable now. Totally usable. And in fact, there's a lot of drivers and stuff the guy has set up. So like in Windows 10 or whatever. But this is a nice little POS system for like a small general store or you're running a small hotel motel or whatever. And you just don't have the money to buy a robust POS system. I mean, you probably have a PC so you could actually have this system running and you preset up your stuff and you're good to go. And it does have password protection. So, okay, so we'll just put this in there. The amount's five dollars or whatever and you can change the price or whatever you hit your total tells you what's due if you're taking cash or credit card some of you may say oh well how do you do the credit card well normally you would just have this separate little credit card kiosk thing and then just key it in and keep the credit receipt that's the way they did it back in the day probably easier ways there's probably free stuff now and easier programs to use but i just found this one to be extremely stable i actually worked for a while helping people set up uh, POS systems. And we, when they couldn't afford the uh, actual system I would recommend, they would, I would actually recommend this because it was free. So it was a, it was a neat little thing to use back in the day. How do you get out of it? Which is a question now. And I guess I would just have to avoid this entire transaction. So let's just avoid that and go, there we go. And go back to the main menu and does other stuff. Like if you have a cash drawer, uh, connected. You could do a no sale. You can lock the register. You could run reports and you can network this uh, different ways of doing it. It's actually very simple to network together. So if you need two um, terminals for ringing up people, you could obviously do it that way as well. All right. It should be here. This one it was called positive. Um, it was a more robust one. It was one, I think if you had a larger business. So this is one of those things that yeah, you, uh, if this is like the real deal, it had different things. And if you had a larger company, this is something you would run because it had different things of accounting, um, a lot more merchandise and inventory control, uh, managing employees, time clocks and so forth. But, uh, 
we'll just go ahead and yeah, we'll, we'll do station one employee ID. Okay, we're in. Um, I didn't want you to see my employee ID, so we kind of jumped that menu real quick. Um, so to create an invoice, you just hit create invoice and bam, there it is. Um, and I think I did something test. Yeah, so there's the test sale. And then when you're finished uh, ringing people up and entering in items, you would just simply total the thing out, which I think you hit F10. Yeah, so this guy owes $25, but he gave me 30. So his change due uh, would be $5. And then you hit process, bam, it's there. I could go through all the intricacies of this program. The one thing you'll notice it is a demo version I'm running here. Uh, I've never actually found the key or the full version of this. So anybody that comes across it, please log it and put it up on archive.org. I would love to have a full version of this. Again, that's something you'd ever use again, but I'd just rather have the full version than a, than a working demo. The next one we're gonna go into is a program called ACPAC. Um, ACPAC was actually an earlier one, been around for years and a lot of companies used and plus, and it's just a simple order entry thing. If you had a business, you would just, uh, enter in your different things of employees. Um, this one I actually think was meant more for like a terminal use thing. Just looking at the way it appears and stuff. It looks like something I would have saw walking into some type of business where a lady's entering in orders and you'd see it on like an old uh, terminal type thing. This is, seems like is what you would see. Um, so that's basically ACPAC. I mean, is this program usable today? Probably you could. All these programs could be usable today. It's just a matter of why would you? But yes, you could. And now that we finished up number five, which is business, let's move right on to number six and just go into finance. <laughs> Why not? And for that, we would be using Quicken back in the day or maybe Peachtree or one of the other ones uh, for accounting. This would be more for like home accounting. I don't think you'd use this for business. So I believe that to start the program is just Q. Uh, yes, I have a, yeah, okay. Uh, it's, yeah. See, now I already installed this. So this is one of those weird things. And one thing I've always noticed about the DOS version of Quicken, which I think up to 2.0 or 2. Point something or other, uh, up to version two, it was a DOS program and then it switched to Windows, but this looks very much like ProWrite. So I'm wondering if the same people may have written the program or so forth. That'd be an interesting fact to figure out if maybe one made the other or somehow they were connected. Uh, it is still installing. So once this finishes, we'll move right into it. Okay, now that we're installed, uh, we type Q. Okay. Yeah, so you have a register and you can set up, you know, your, your different categories and so forth. And then once you get things uh, all set, uh, yeah, I'll just go with that. Name for account. And let's say the balance is uh, $1,000 in 12 of, uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, and there's your your thing. You just enter in your different uh, data. I don't know how to shut off that that little prompt thing, but uh, it pretty much works like a, a program that you would have nowadays as far as like if you had a modern day version of Quicken, it's just like a check register, electronic check register. It's just like an electronic uh, check register. And that's Quicken. I mean, there's other stuff you can do. You can obviously do checks and things like that. But I mean, nowadays you just pay online or, or you could do an electronic check or whatever. So why would you even bother using Quicken? All right, that finishes up uh, finance and quick in. Not much to say there, but uh, you get the idea. Let's move on to number seven and automation. Yeah, so nowadays you got all these different automation things that you can use between Siri and Alexa and and Google Voice and so forth with your locks and your your lights and operating different things. Well, back in the day, you used a thing called X10, and it was around. <laughs>
Yeah, a little clip from a classic uh, movie back in the 80s there. Yeah, and those things were doable via this program called, uh, this whole system called X10. You could control lamps and turn things on and off. Uh, they had a bunch of different things, and I'm probably just showing pictures or stuff right now because as you can see on my screen, I can't actually run the X10 program without the controller interface. And I just, I, I got rid of it years ago. I wish I'd kept it and stuffed it away somewhere, but one of those things that just kind of became outdated. So we will move right on to our next day of Christmas. Number eight, we're going to call this just the odd mention because I didn't really have a complete list and I'm probably missing a few things. So please leave a comment to other cool programs that are worth checking out, or maybe I could still find and, and show on the channel, but we'll go into this one. Good afternoon, everybody. 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 Uh, yeah, uh, this was featured on another YouTuber's channel, but there was a Windows version of it, and my doves are going nuts, so apologize in advance, as they always do when I'm doing these videos. Sometimes they can get a little loud. So let's just look up uh, something simple on here, like a martini. So let's type in martini. There we go. Okay, this search actually was a, a time-lapse thing. It took forever for it to find this drink. Would I use this program nowadays? No, it is slow. I don't know if there's a way to speed it up. Sometimes there's things you could do in the auto execute bat files to speed things up and put files equals 99 or whatever. But uh, in this situation, I just want to show this program, but it's just kind of cool that it does, it does give you uh, different search options and different drink recipes uh, for different martinis and so forth. And it was just a simple program. They, lit they later on made a uh, Windows version of it, which I think was probably a little more user-friendly than this one. All right, moving right on to number nine, which is database program schedulers, that type of thing. And we'll go into one called AV Track. This is just a simple little program I found back in the day. Kind of neat if I typed it in right. Uh, okay. Ah, there we go. <laughs> it's funny because th I pulled this right from my archives and apparently I had put a password on it. So interestingly enough, I somehow remember the password. Uh, this one, of course, is unregistered. Anybody knows how I could ever register this. It would be kind of cool to do so. I mean, I've tried different things. There used to be a, a trick you could do with some of these old DOS programs where you could just enter in like all zeros and then, and then put in whatever you want up here and then bam, you were good. But uh, obviously that doesn't work in this situation, even though it's, it looks like it did, it did not. It's, it'll just go back when I reload the program. With this program, you could organize your audio and video files, kind of set up a, a category system, and then figure out what you want to put in there. Like in this situation, there was I had some music in there from my when I used to DJ, um, and easily figure out which CDs were located where, and each number sequence, and which bins they were in, and so forth. Uh, you could also search by title and go through and figure out you know which song you were. And then there would be a little card that will pull up and tell you, you know, some information about it, how much time it was and so forth. Just a simple little database program. Uh, I believe some radio stations actually use this to, uh, to uh, track their music. Speaking of radio stations, I'm hoping to have a future video coming out on something very cool. I'm still working on it. Let's just hope and pray that it, uh, the whole thing uh, works out and you'll be able to see something very cool which is gonna go along with, kind of with this next mention on this next uh, program, if I can find it, uh, which would be Music Master. Okay, we're in. I somehow figure out the password on that one as well. So this one, uh, yeah, so you have your music, your coding, and this is basically what it looked like when they used to schedule stuff on an at, or at an actual radio station. So right now it's it's it right now it's searching the database and it found a song with hello so hello I love you the doors um, it would tell you which disc number it was this would be six thousand two cut one 
And there was different things you could do with the song if you wanted to edit or so forth. But the main thing you would use this program for obviously is scheduling. So you'd go in and schedule stuff um, using this and schedule. We'll just jump some of these menus and we'll hit begin. And this feature not available. I believe this, this program actually used a studio dongle, so it's pretty much useless as it sits. Um, and yeah, there's the interface connection where you could actually interface it to certain systems like uh, Rackus Digilink system or different ones, automation systems you, you would use back in the day. Uh, in our situation early on, we didn't have full automation, so they would actually generate paper schedules and print them out uh, versus And it, of course, sits in evaluation mode. If anybody ever finds a, a dongle for this program, please let me know. I'd love to have it and be able to play around with this more and show you more of this program. But you get the general idea of you know what it did and what it looked like and what they used back in the day to, you know, your favorite radio station. This is what a lot of stations used to actually schedule their music and keep it on a good rotation so you didn't hear the same songs over and over again. Kind of like now. <laughs> And we are on to number 10. 10 is a fun one because we're going to go into entertainment. Games. Yes, we're going to go into games. You could have all your favorite games on your DOS computer. And as long as they ran on DOS. And Wacky Wheels, Zaytax. I mean, you had Duke Nukem. You had all kinds of fun games that you could get back in the day. And they're still fun today. Some of my favorite games I still play from DOS days, like SimCity 2000. I love the original, you know, the way the original DOS version works and plays, and just these different ones and these different games and the selections from them, and they were just different back in the day. They, were, they could be complicated, but they looked incredibly simple for the time. I'm not going to get into any of these games because we're technically not talking about games today, but it had to be a mention on day number 10. I'm not going to get too much into SBBS, which is the server end of the program. I showed in an earlier video on how you can manipulate that and do certain things to set up your own at home or just simply play some of those two, you know, the interactive two player games they had back in the day that used ANSI graphics. Kind of cool stuff. On this one, we're just going to use Throwback BBS because it's one of the ones I like and it doesn't have a lot of prompt menus to it. It pretty much pulls up its thing. It does a cool little ANSI graphic thing in the beginning. Now, right away, I mean, there's all those different things I could go into here, but we're in here for the door games. Yeah, that's the fun part because the door games gives you access to all kinds of cool programming and different things going on and RPG games, multiplayer. Um, there's your multiplayer and there's actually real time ones where you can play somebody with chess, checkers, one of my favorites, Battleship, Connect 4, Othello. There's other multiplayer where I think it's just kind of turn by turn basis. I've never really played around with, you know, some of these on the left hand side, but the right ones I, I've definitely used back in the day. Uh, for this situation, we're just going to go in and go into like mega slots. Yeah. And then we will place a bet. Yeah, we just do that and then bam. Just a simple little thing. Once you put your bets in, you, you know, you obviously line it up like a slot machine. Is it corny and cheesy? Yeah, kind of. But to me, it is kind of fun and relaxing just to, you know, see how much I can win and how far my bankroll will go up. But the one funny thing about this game is uh, it has a little feature in it where they, this casino has muggers. So it actually at randomly pick you and you'll get mugged. And it's quite amazing because it's quite, it can happen quite often. But you usually get back some of your money and that's okay. And we'll go ahead and disconnect from that. I just want to show a little bit of BBSing. There's obviously a ton of things you can do, a ton of games you can play, a ton of things you can do on the BBS still. And just as fun to dial into somebody else's or just as much fun to make up your own. And I have in the past. I just Hosting one nowadays is a little more complicated than I like it to be, just with, for security reasons and so forth. That'll end on the BBS note. Now let's go ahead and jump over to something else I wanted to show real quick on this video. It's been covered on a few other YouTube channels, but let's take a look. There we go. Now we're switched over to our actual DOS computer. And I do have a lot of the same things I, I showed on the other machine in installing this one, like ProWrite, the menu system, MPX player. We're using the trusty old Compaq uh, LTE 5000 series. 
uh, simply because it's the only thing I have Kermit installed on. And Kermit was basically a terminal program for DOS. Uh, in most situations nowadays, because you would use it for dial-up, you can't do that. So I went out and searched and searched and finally found one of these doohickeys. Now these things are pretty dang cool. I mean, it plugs into your serial port and I had to use an adapter because I don't have the larger serial port thing and I obviously might have purchased the wrong one and then you just need a USB source to power it. So let's get this connected and go ahead and do some DOS BBSing. Flash forward, okay, we are connected. So let's go ahead and get into this Kermit. So Kermit, we will do Kermit. And the one thing I haven't figured out, and I haven't got it working this way, is I only can seem to use 1200 baud. I don't know if it's a limitation with the adapter or something I'm doing wrong or something I need to change behind the scenes. Anybody knows, make a comment on that. There's something I'm not doing right with this. So we're just gonna go ahead and set speed to 1200. Then we're gonna set the terminal type. Uh, terminal type, I think you gotta type type ANSI. Yes, okay. And the last thing should be fine, so then we should go ahead and be able to connect. Okay, we are connected. I didn't want to show any passwords or anything there because it does actually show up on the screen. Basically, let you connect to your Wi Fi system. For some reason, it won't connect to my main router, so I do have to use my phone. So let's go ahead and connect to a BBS. So we'll, for that, we'll do the ATDT command. And we will type in this website, end of the line, bbs.com. We'll give them a little pub since we use the throwback one on the other video. And yeah, look at this coming in line by line, much slower than if you use a modern day computer. But yeah, it does work. I'm actually using, to think about using a computer back from this era, from the late 90s, um, with some kind of adapter made within the last few years and then be able to connect to something that truly was from the era back then just seems quite amazing nowadays and, and quite imaginative, imaginative too. And we're logged in. And more graphics, line by line. Again, I could, this could be 10 times quicker. The problem I'm having is I, I'm stuck in 1200 baud right now. If I, I switch it for some reason, it just gibberish shows up and maybe somebody could explain that in the commentary or send me a note. Uh, I could do more research on it, but this wasn't the main point of the video. It was just something I wanted to show within the video as far as the communications uh, section of the video. And as you can see, there's different menus that come up and ask you different things. And of course, you gotta wait for every one of them to completely draw and prompt you before you can move on to the next menu. Okay, the video's jumping a little bit. That's simply because of how slow this is and I wanted to speed things up. But let's go ahead and look, to look at the, the forecast. Let's look at the NASA picture of the day and see how long that takes to uh, draw out and what the picture actually is. Ah, I see here. Okay, this terminal does not support Sixel graphics. Please, you know, sync term version 1.1. Yeah, that's the other one I use on the, something like that on the other computer. So that would be a thing to think about if I wanted a be better terminal program and be able to actually see what the NASA picture of the day was. And I know what you're all saying right now. I really want to see that picture. Well, we can arrange that. And welcome to the 12th day of Christmas. We had plenty of dove noises in here because there is doves in the 12 days of Christmas. So I guess it's appropriate that they would be cooing um, the, through the whole video. Uh, I have this uh, fella up on the screen for a reason. And it's probably most represents the era of radio I came from toward the end of my radio career back in 2000. Uh, you can see in the picture, you can actually see the Tascam um, tape deck. It works with one of those. It looks like a Denon CD player. If I'm not mistaken, you can correct me in the things below. And this looks like some kind of digital controller thing or possibly could even be a mini disc. I'm not really sure what's on the bottom there. I love how the keyboards are just kind of thrown there, you know, because it looks like this studio is never really set up for computer automation. It's got its board here. I can't really make out what kind of board that is.
And worth mentioning, because this is a DOS program and one that was used by a lot of radio stations back in the day, and that would be the Arrakis Digilink system. And I kind of teased it earlier, but it was a cool thing. And it actually is funny because you can actually see, I think this was the free version, Windows version here. So they must have used this for their music and then used this for their commercials. They may not have that music add-on feature thing. But I'm hoping to have a future video if everything works out on this system. That'll do it for this IJDM. I want to wish you a happy holidays and a Merry Christmas if you're a person that celebrates Christmas. If not, I still hope you enjoy your holidays and have a happy new year. We'll see you next time on IJDM.